This is on assignment. Hello and welcome to On Assignment, VOA's weekly look at the stories behind the headlines. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Philip Alexio. This week, what it's like to cover a military court-martial. We'll ask our correspondent reporting on the case against U.S. Army Private Bradley Manning. One of the United States' largest news organizations gets a new owner, along with renewed questions about the future of the newspaper business. And we'll hop on a slow train to nowhere in particular that's proving popular in South Korea. It's time to get our own train moving, so come on aboard for On Assignment. This summer, U.S. Army Private Bradley Manning was found guilty of leaking more than 700,000 sensitive government documents to the whistleblower website WikiLeaks. His sentence, 35 years in prison. Now, his conviction on espionage charges has raised questions about how best to punish those accused of leaking classified material. It also put on display something rarely seen by the public at large, a military court-martial. VOA's Luis Ramirez has been covering the trial and talks to me about the unique challenges it presents to journalists. Let's take a look, starting with one of his reports. After three years in custody that included time and solitary confinement, the verdict is in for Bradley Manning, guilty of espionage. He was acquitted of the most serious charge, aiding the enemy, but the espionage conviction may still get him a maximum sentence of 136 years in prison. Some of the leaked vials were found in the hideout of Osama bin Laden. Manning earlier pleaded guilty to what is being called the largest leak of secret U.S. documents in history. 700,000 files sent to WikiLeaks while he was deployed in Iraq. They included this video of a U.S. helicopter crew attacking civilians in Baghdad. Come on, fire! A broader question would be that in this particular trial, which has garnered worldwide interest, uh, do you think that the outcome, whatever it will end up being, will affect U.S. policy in any way? I think that's inevitable. We've got uh, at least two areas here that, uh, uh, well, attention was called to changes that are necessary. Um, the first would be in uh, how the military uh, screens uh, recruits. Um, how it deals with uh, mental uh, issues uh, in the military. Um, in the case of Private Manning, uh, there were plenty of red flags that would have indicated uh, that he uh, perhaps was not fit for the position of intelligence analyst. You know, another area where uh, analysts say it's likely we're, we're going to see some re-examination of how things are done is how intelligence is, is handled. Um, Manning was a pretty low-ranking person in the Army, a low-ranking analyst, and yet he had access to State right. Department files, uh, a wide range of, of, of uh, sensitive information. And uh, you know, people are wondering, why did he have access to all of this? Uh, why did he have access to things that he was not uh, specifically working on? Who, who shows up to really observe these proceedings? Is it, it's not just, the, not just reporters, right? In the case of uh, Private Bradley Manning, it's been very largely activists who support his cause, who support uh, um, uh, the release of, of, of documents and support the transparency in the government. Um, civil, civil libertarians, uh, it's, uh, quite, a, quite a group that gathers out there uh, pretty much every morning. Um, a lot of them are, are people who were part of the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, so you've got a wide array. Have you heard as to why something like that happens, how somebody like that might fall through the cracks, I guess? Well, his master sergeant took the stand and very uh, clearly uh, stated what his rationale was. The, despite having a number of, of reports, first-hand reports, of, uh, that, that this young man was having uh, severe emotional problems, um, chose to, to keep him on. In one case, uh, in one instance, he chose not to uh, c uh, relay an email, a troubling email that he had received from Manning uh, up to his superiors, uh, in which Manning described a, a very severe emotional issues that were preventing him from, from basically from functioning. Um, uh, there was a, a picture, a photo of him uh, dressed in a wig and makeup that he said, you know, this is my problem. 
Um, and uh, well, while the military uh, does not have the infrastructure or the uh, to to take care of issues like this, um, it is clear that uh, had his master sergeant uh, taken action, uh, maybe Manning would not have been put in this uh, sensitive position where he got into so much trouble. Luis, what are the challenges in, in, in covering a court martial? Well, primarily it would be access. Um, these are held on military basis, which means you can't just walk in like you would in a normal civilian courtroom um, and sit down. You have to be cleared. Uh, there are a great deal of restrictions in terms of uh, cameras, recording devices, uh, air cards. Uh, so uh, one relies uh, largely on the sketch artist and on notes that one takes on, on pen and paper. And as we mentioned, soon after I spoke with Luis, the judge in the trial, Army Colonel Denise Lynn, sentenced Manning to 35 years in military prison. But uh, Alex, it's worth uh, noting that he was facing more than double that, up to 90 years in prison. Yeah, big, big difference. All right, well, still to come, a behind-the-scenes look at one of VOA's newest music programs, one that's beyond category. You're watching On Assignment. Amazon.com founder Jeff Bezos made headlines recently when he bought the Washington Post. The historic newspaper is one of the United States' most influential publications and many Americans' choice for news about politics. VOA business reporter Mill Arcega joins me now. And Mill, you, you say that the initial reaction to this $250 million purchase of the Post at least so far, has been kind of positive. Why is that? Kind of positive because we know clearly the business model, the newspaper business model, is not working. Mm -hmm. So I think the initial excitement there was that here we have a pi a, an internet pioneer who has very deep pockets and a lot of patience taking over a money-losing institution that has that means a lot to the to the country. So I think that's where the initial euphoria came from. So the obvious question would be why would somebody like Jeff Bezos want to purchase the Washington Post? Which is again a very good question. Uh, nobody really knows why. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of speculation that perhaps it's a vanity kind of a uh, of a thing or perhaps he really wants to ingratiate himself with the Washington crowd or perhaps he really wants to make some changes to the whole newspaper industry which I think is, is likely what he wants to do. Well I mean he's running Amazon.com it's a digital operation the newspaper well they're trying to go digital so are they looking at him as sort of like maybe he would be or I guess he's thinking of being an, an innovator and, and to come up with all sorts of new ways to manage an operation that's clearly failing. At least well, you know he is an innovator, Phil. Yeah. I mean, in, in 1995, when he sold his first book, there were a lot of people who were saying, Amazon is never going to amount to much. By 2001, he was a billionaire. By 2005, he was, he was upending the way we, we purchased books. And by 2008, he's changed the way we actually shop. So what is it saying now that a storied newspaper like the Washington Post, there have been others obviously, sure. uh, rich people are buying these, but what is it saying now about the newspaper industry? Where is it heading? It means it's on its way down. Unless something is done, unless we change this actual business model, the newspaper business is just going to continue declining. There have been some, some newspapers that have actually made the shift. Um, we don't know exactly what Jeff Bezos is going to do because he's not saying, you know, what it is he's planning on doing. All we know is we have a lot of suggestions from, from uh, informed experts who suggest that, you know, we may have to do some radical changes. Well, do we know anything about his political leanings since it's sort of considered, it's the, you know, it's the paper for all things politics, at least here in Washington, certainly around the country. Jeff Bezos has been described as libertarian uh, in his political views. And, you know, the reason why it's stuck is because he never challenged it. Uh, we do know that he's kind of anti-union and he sees unions as, as sort of a, uh, uh, an impediment to doing efficient business. We know how efficient he, he likes to run his businesses, but few think he's going to run the business like he runs Amazon. So uh, he might be in line there to be an innovator to, to try to figure out new ways to actually run the newspaper business because clearly uh, the newspaper business, they're not getting enough revenue from their print advertising like they used to. And even the online ads uh, are not right. making up for the shortfall. Well, so it should be pretty fun. You know, an interesting comment that we saw on this, uh, the comedy show, the satire, the Daily Show. Okay. And they said, I'll get it right, more people are buying newspapers today than people are buying newspapers. 
you know, I mean, the billionaires are taking them and we're not buying them, but right. they're still buying the papers. And, and, and we have to ask ourselves, why are they doing that? Clearly, it, it, it involves a great deal of risk. And if you think about Jeff Bezos' uh, worth, net worth, I mean, 250 million is really- Chump change. Chump change, 1% of his total net and worth. And he can afford to take the risk. He can afford to take the risk. Well, uh, Mel, we have something special for you, today's version of the Washington oh, Post. Oh my goodness. You might want to hang on to that because it could be a collector's item someday, I'm Thank sure you it will be. Thank uh, you very much, Phil. You may be a rich man someday place. if you can sell that. Hey, uh, coming up, we'll take a look back at why a slow train to nowhere is proving to be such a hit in South Korea. You're watching On Assignment. It is summertime, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, and for many, that means summer vacation. Well, in Korea, Phil, tourists actually have two new options, mm -hmm. and that is a pair of slow-moving trains that take visitors to remote areas of the country. Well, how slow do these trains move? I don't know, but uh, in this On Assignment Rewind, VOA's uh, Steve Herman tells us about his own ride on the tracks. Let's start with some of his report. On the O-Train, co-rail attendant Beck Daun explains that those accustomed to high-speed rail travel will experience a significant change of pace and style during a ride on what is known as the spine of the Korean Peninsula. When passengers board for the first time, at first they are awed by the train's exterior design and the internal decor. Some passengers disembark to stretch their legs and watch a group of farmers. Others remain on board, waving to those working in the field and strike up a brief conversation. Let's go eat sashimi after I finish work here. These two trains are really the first trains purely designed for leisurely travel. We have in the city of Seoul, uh, of course, we have a sophisticated uh, subway system with uh, lots of uh, commuter trains. And there are the KTX high-speed high trains to take people uh, from uh, one big city to another. But these are really trains that have been designed purely for travel. And the V train only travels at an average speed of 30 kilometers per hour over its uh, 28 uh, kilometer course back and forth between Buncheon and Choram stations. And the windows are very wide and long and you get a chance to see um, scenery like you're not going to really see uh, from a train anywhere else in South Korea. So basically what you're describing are uh, largely trains to nowhere uh, that move slowly. So what's the appeal of, these, uh, of the, taking these trips? Well, the appeal is, is really to uh, savor the views of the natural rocks and cliffs along steep valleys and mountains. If you are in a hurry, do not take South Korea's newest trains. The electric four-coach O-Train, running four times daily, circles a five-hour, 257-kilometer course with stops at 13 stations. The three-coach V-Train operates three times daily on a 70-minute shuttle between two rural stations 28 kilometers apart. Who did you meet on board? Who was taking this? It really went across all ages. Uh, we were out on a weekday, so I don't think we saw as many children as might normally be on the train on weekends. In fact, there was a, a group of um, elderly um, um, passengers who were all outfitted with their hiking gear. I'll tell you, I've climbed uh, a mountain or two here in South Korea, and um, people who were in their 70s were just breezing past me on the ascent. Um, Koreans are very hardy hikers, and they're in great shape. So I think for some of these people, it was a chance to uh, get out uh, to the countryside and get off the train and, and go into the countryside as well. Steve, uh, you're speaking to us in Seoul. You work there a lot. That is a 24-hour city, constantly abuzz, sort of maddeningly fast. What was it like for you to take the five hours that it takes to get on essentially this very slow, probably pretty quiet train? Well, we actually went on both trains, uh, departing from Seoul Station at 7.45 in the morning on the O train, and then um, journeying out for a few hours to catch the V train, and then returning on the O train, getting back, 
into Seoul at about 10.30 a night. So it was a very long day. Uh, but it was extremely refreshing just to get out of Seoul, uh, where I spend most of my time, uh, and, and just breathe in deeply some fresh mountain air. That was really the highlight for me. Hey, there's a new music program here at VOA, Beyond Category, a concert series hosted by Eric Felton. It is the latest in a long line of VOA programs that cross cultural boundaries through jazz. The TV show is recorded at various jazz clubs around Washington where Eric not only interviews his guests, but he also joins them on stage for some musical improv. Now in this On Assignment Rewind, I meet up with him at one of those clubs, Blues Alley, to talk about the program. You know, the great thing about jazz is it's music of the moment. And, uh, you know, not everything is improvised in jazz, but, but a lot of it is improvised, which means that the musicians aren't playing off of uh, an exact set of notes that have been written out, but a lot of it is spontaneous, a musical conversation. So that's typically how you stage it, then you have them perform first, get a feel for their playing, and then you do the interview? Well, we mix up, we mix up having the performance and the interview, and, uh, and what's great is we're able to talk about what they've just played and then get an idea of what they're going to play next for us and get to hear it. What can you tell us about Willis Conover, of course, as a figure from the Voice of America. Um, is your show, are you hoping that this will be a resurgence of VOA at the, at the helm of jazz? Well, yeah, VOA had this tremendous role in the history of jazz. One, broadcasting around the world, and perhaps most famously broadcasting behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and one of the great things is that uh, the first show we taped for this new program was taped here at, at Blues Alley. And uh, with this wonderful, piano player Eldar Jangirov, who's a complete phenom. And um, when he was a kid growing up in Kyrgyzstan, his father was a jazz fan and, and turned him on to jazz originally because his father had been listening to Willis Conover on wow. VOA. So it kind of comes full circle. As a matter of fact, my, my father was um, uh, was born um, a while ago, and, and actually he was a teenager when when Stalin was ruling Soviet Union, and he actually heard um, jazz on Voice of America. That was his first um, introduction to jazz, and he carried that love throughout his whole life. This tremendous legacy that VOA has in in being a voice of jazz around the world of America's music. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to, to build on that legacy. This has to be a labor of love for you. You have your own background in music. Uh, you told us you know, that sometimes you actually get up and perform with the, the subjects of your, of your interviews and the people that you feature on your show. Tell us a little bit about your musical background and how that's influenced this program. Well, I was very fortunate. My, uh, my, my father and my grandfather were professional jazz musicians. And, uh, and so I learned from a very young age. My grandfather, who played in swing bands in the 1920s and 30s, was my trombone teacher. And uh, it was just, you know, what a wonderful childhood, you know, learning at my grandfather's All age. All in the family. Yes. All in the family, absolutely. So as a player, one of the um, one of the things that I wanted to do with this show was do a little bit of a, it's a wonderful piano player named Marion McPartland and she had for a long time had a radio show called Piano Jazz and she would sit with other piano players mm. um, and they'd talk about the music and they'd play things together and they'd kind of bounce off one another and it was always unpredictable and so we're taking a, a, a nod from Marion McPartland's show to, to try to capture that same unpredictability one of the, the challenges of the show that's a lot of fun is one week we may have somebody who's a, a real sort of traditional swing type of player and then the next week somebody who's doing electronica stuff and yeah. the challenge for me is to figure out how to play one with the swing guy right. and then what to play with the, the electronica guy and so it's, um, it's kind of a tight rope act and that's the fun of it and I, and I think adds a little unpredictability you know to whether <laughs> I'm going to succeed or <laughs> fail at it and, uh, and, and that makes it fun for me and I hope it makes it fun for the audience oh, as well. I, I, I know that it does and we've seen you succeeding very well and 
we see that you have your trombone sitting by your side, so you are going to play a little bit for us. There's not really room to play right here, so I'm going yeah, to step up to the step Blues to the Alley stage. stage. That there would be go. perfect. Great. <laughs> Well, that was a lot of fun to look back on that piece and also to remember how much hidden talent we have here at BOA, not just Eric Felton, but there are a lot of others who yeah, are musically inclined. a lot inclined. of people around here. We just aren't there yet, you and I. Maybe one day. Yeah, maybe. One day. We've got to work on it. Well, finally, New York City isn't often thought of as a beach town, but in fact, the city's southeastern edge is all coastline. Surfing lovers can hop on the subway with their surfboards and be riding the waves at Rockaway Beach an hour later. Well, that's what drew surfer and photographer Susanna Ray to move there eight years ago and to stay through the wreckage of last year's superstorm Sandy. VOA's Carolyn Weaver visited with Ray and has this profile. Since 2005, art photographer Susanna Ray has lived and shot at Rockaway Beach, a working class neighborhood where New York City ends and the Atlantic Ocean begins. She came here first to surf and then to photograph the surfing community one almost as multicultural as the rest of New York. It's become large enough at this point that there really is a niche for every kind of person. Um, you know, this huge hipster wave that everyone keeps talking about, which is a lot of young people from Brooklyn, Manhattan, maybe parts of Queens, who come down on the train and they can come down for the day and surf. There's sort of this middle ground, which is people like myself and my husband, some other surfing families on the block. The project, titled The Right Coast, the surfing nickname for the East Coast, includes images of surfers taking their boards through blizzards to ride the waves. Ray says that's because most of the year, the waves at Rockaway are small. So when the good waves come, you have to, if you're really dedicated and you want to be out all year round, you have to say it's snowing outside, it's a 20 mile per hour northeast offshore wind, and I'm going to get my board and go surf. Her community was upended when Superstorm Sandy hit last October. Ray's latest work, What Are the Wild Waves Saying?, at Manhattan's Bonnie Baruby Gallery, documents the aftermath. A new sports car mired under sand and debris is the signature image. It's kind of that dream cherry red car. I think it's a symbol of a little bit of luxury, a little bit of fun, and it's being completely crushed by the boardwalk. The work is exhibited with an audio montage by radio producer Jen Poyant. I saw the water running down the driveway it started to come under the door, and I remember Claire going, oh my God, the water's coming under the door. And I rub up in the blanket like this, and I, all I'm saying, Lord, save me. Save me, Lord, don't let the house go. After Sandy, Ray says, her community no longer feels so secure. It really felt like something had been permanently lost. What is kind of terrific is that now that it's summer, I realize it hasn't been lost completely. You know, hopefully we will regain a lot of, of what, you know, the community in the days after the storm, a lot of what we thought was gone forever. Carolyn Weaver, VOA News, Rockaway Beach, New York. And that's it for this week. Join us next time for a special look at a new VOA documentary. Right. Next week marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s historic March on Washington. And we'll hear from those who were actually there to hear his famous I Have a Dream speech. In the meantime, you can find every episode of On Assignment on VOANews.com, Facebook, and with complete captions on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you next time.